In this video, I'm going to discuss how to describe the motion of objects launched into the air. I will explain why objects move this way, and I will show you how to solve quantitative problems about any object launched horizontally into the air. We're going to start by looking at two different mass bowling balls launched horizontally into the air with different initial speeds. The orange bowling ball has a mass of about 3 kilograms, and the, the gray bowling ball has a mass of about 7 kilograms. When we compare the motion of each bowling ball while flying through the air, we can reach some basic conclusions about the horizontal and vertical part of the object's motion when they are moving through the air. We can see that the faster a ball was moving on the table, the faster it moves horizontally while moving forward through the air. If it was rolling slow on the table, it moves forward slowly while moving through the air, and if it was rolling fast on the table, like the orange bowling ball on the right, it moves a lot faster while moving forward while flying through the air. When we compare how each of the balls move vertically, we can see that regardless of mass or initial launch velocity, they all behave the same. They're falling similarly. At the moment each ball leaves the table, the vertical part of the ball's velocity is zero. After leaving the table, all of the bowling balls speed up in the negative direction, and it appears that all of the balls are changing their y velocity by the same amount each second. They're falling together. So we can conclude that all of the bowling balls have the same vertical acceleration, the same acceleration in the, in the negative y direction. In class, we did some video analysis using a software called Logger Pro to analyze the motion of all four of the bowling balls, and we found a lot of similarities. We found that horizontally, when we graphed how the horizontal position changes over time, just how the ball's moving forward through space, it, the horizontal position changed linearly, showing that the horizontal velocity was constant. And this dashed line, remember, represented when the ball left the table. So the bowling ball was given an initial horizontal speed of about 1.7 meters per second on the table, and at the time it left the table, it kept moving forward at that same horizontal velocity. We said that there's, there's zero acceleration in the x direction. The x part of the velocity didn't change. And when we thought about, well, why would the horizontal part of the velocity not change, we had to go back to force diagrams. So we said, while on the table, the bowling ball is feeling a pull of gravity from the earth, and the table's pushing up on it with a normal force, and there's no significant forces in the x direction. We assume that friction is not significant because if it was, it'd be slowing down while moving on the table. And we assumed also air resistance was insignificant or negligible because horizontally, looking at our graph, it didn't appear to slow down at all. And so there were no forces in the x direction. So therefore, the x part of the acceleration was zero. Horizontally, it was moving at a constant velocity. When we looked at the vertical part of the motion, on the table it wasn't changing its vertical position or its y position because the table was flat, but as soon as it left the table it fell towards the ground, and when we looked at how the velocity was changing, just the vertical part of the velocity or the, the y component of its velocity, as soon as it left the table it started speeding up in the negative direction, it had a negative acceleration, each second the velocity got more negative, and we found out that for all the balls, regardless of how fast they were launched or moving on the table, and regardless of their mass, we all got accelerations of about negative 9.9, negative 10, negative 9.8, all around negative 10 meters per second per second. Which, remember, that's the acceleration of any object in free fall, even if dropped from rest. And so these bowling balls, the vertical part of their motion was just the same as a freely falling object, even if it wasn't launched. And how did we explain, like, why was there zero acceleration in the y direction on the table and negative acceleration off the table? Well, on the table, what's true of the sum of the forces in the y direction? These two forces are balanced, so the sum of the forces would be zero. There would be no vertical acceleration while the ball was on the table. But as soon as the ball leaves the table, that normal force goes away, but the gravitational force does not. And so the ball's going to start speeding up in the negative direction. Uh, and it turns out the acceleration is that of freefall, negative 9.8 meters per second each second. And we're just going to approximate that to be negative 10 meters per second per second. So when any object is moving through the air, assuming that air resistance is negligible, when we look at just the vertical part of its motion, 
it's a uniform acceleration or a constant acceleration because the velocity changes linearly and this is how much it changes each and every second negative 10 meters per second for each second of falling now that we know this conceptually we should be able to think through how to solve problems quantitatively where an object is launched through the air and it's only under the influence of gravity there's a gravitational force pulling down so there's a negative acceleration of 10 meters per second per second and horizontally there's zero acceleration um, and when objects are launched through the air and under the influence of gravity alone we call those projectile problems so this is a horizontally launched projectile problem let's take the case where there's you know not a bowling ball let's just say somebody's on a mountain bike and they ride off of a cliff and at the moment they leave the cliff they're moving at 20 meters per second well, we know that horizontally, they're going to keep that same speed. They're going to keep moving forward at 20 meters per second. And so we could predict like one second later, how far in front of the cliff will they be? Well, if they're moving at 20 meters each second and horizontally, they keep that same speed. That means one second later, they're going to have to be 20 meters in front of the cliff, right? Assuming they're still moving through the air. Uh, two seconds later, will, where will they be? Well, they'll be another 20 meters forward. So they're going to be 40 meters in front of the cliff. And three seconds later, because their horizontal velocity stays constant, they're going to be 60 meters in front of the cliff. Right? That's what's true of the horizontal part of their motion and their horizontal position at each of these times. But the whole time they're moving forward, they're also falling vertically. So we need to think about, you know, one second later, where will they be? Or two seconds later, how far below their initial position will they be? Or three seconds later, how far below their initial position will they be? So we're going to have to basically solve for the vertical displacement of the biker. But remember, no matter how fast they're launched off the cliff, these bikers will have an acceleration of negative 10 meters per second per second. It'll fall just like if they were to step off the cliff and fall straight down. So how do we find out the vertical displacement of something that has an acceleration of negative 10 meters per second per second? Well, we've done this before, all the way back in unit one. So we have equations which relate how far something travels to its initial velocity, how much time it takes to do that in its acceleration. This is one of our three kinematic equations. For solving for vertical displacement, let's change the way that this equation looks to remind us that all of these variables in the equation have to deal with the y direction, not the x direction. So let's write it like this. So the change in y position or vertical displacement is equal to the initial velocity in the y direction multiplied by time plus one half times the acceleration in the y direction multiplied by time squared. So let's find out what the vertical displacement or the change in y position will be for one second of falling, right? So the initial velocity, remember, if this biker is coming off of a flat cliff, initially they don't have a vertical velocity. They're not moving vertically yet until they leave the cliff. So the initial y velocity is zero. Time is one second. Our acceleration in the y direction is negative 10 meters per second each second. And we've got to plug in one second and square that. And so if we solve for the vertical displacement, how far does something fall in one second? 1 half times negative 10 is negative 5, times 1 squared is 1, so you get negative 5 meters. So the vertical displacement after falling for one second is 5 meters. They'll be 5 meters lower than what they were at one second. Well, let's do that for 2 seconds and 3 seconds. And the only thing that's going to change in this, in this equation would be the time that we plug in here. The whole time they have the same constant acceleration in the y direction of negative 10 meters per second each second. So after two seconds of falling, we plug in two here. Two squared is four times negative 10 is negative 40 times one half is negative 20. So after two seconds of falling, they will change their vertical position by negative 20 meters. And if we do that for three seconds of falling, plug in three seconds there. Remember, we have to square it. We'd get that they're going to have a vertical change in position or vertical displacement of negative 45 meters. So one second of falling, they're going to be five meters lower. After two seconds of falling, they'll be 20 meters lower. And after three seconds of falling, they'll be 45 meters lower. So let's put this together with how we know the biker is moving horizontally to think things through quantitatively. So uh, if they're here, uh, one second later, we said they're going to be five meters lower than what they were. 
And after two seconds, they're going to be 20 meters lower than what they were. And after three seconds, they'll be 45 meters lower than what they were. So the dashed red lines represent their vertical position at different times, and the dashed blue lines represent their horizontal position at different times. Remember, they're doing this all at the same time. They're moving horizontally and vertically simultaneously. So let's put this together to figure out exactly where they are one second later. Well, they're going to be 20 meters forward and 5 meters down, so they're going to be at this position. Okay, we're, Right now, we're kind of making a two-dimensional motion map. We're going to have dots, which represent the position at one-second intervals, and then we'll go back and add some velocity arrows to represent the horizontal part of their velocity at that position, the vertical part or component of their velocity at that position, and then we'll try to figure out well, what's their actual velocity, and we'll use a black arrow for that. At two seconds, they're going to be 40 meters forward and a total of 20 meters down from where they started. And so at two seconds, we'll put a dot there. And at three seconds, again, it's going to be where these two lines intersect. Uh, they're going to be 60 meters farther forward horizontally from where they started and 45 meters down. <clears throat> and so that third dot is going to be right there. So actually, we should have a dot here at time zero. They're here. One second later, they're here. Two seconds later, they're here. Three seconds later, they're here. And you can see this gives us that curved shape that a projectile follows when they're flying through the air. So let's add some components of the velocity horizontally and vertically at each position. Well, um, in the beginning, they're moving at 20 meters per second, and there is no vertical component of the velocity. And that's their actual velocity. One second later, well, they're still moving horizontally at 20 meters per second. The horizontal part of the velocity doesn't change. And so at each of these dots, we can add an arrow pointed to the right, and we can say that it's positive 20 meters per second, and put a little dash there to remind us that the horizontal velocity stays constant. In the beginning here, the vertical part of the velocity, which we'll use a red arrow for, there's zero length because initially there is no vertical velocity. But one second later, or two seconds later, or three seconds later, there will be. And how does the vertical part of the velocity change? Well, we've got to go back to the acceleration in the y direction. It's negative 10 meters per second each and every second. So after one second of falling, their vertical component of the velocity will be negative 10 meters per second. And it's going to change by another negative 10 meters per second in the next second. So it's going to be then negative 20 meters per second. And one second later, it's got to change by another negative 10 meters per second. And so the vertical component of the velocity after three seconds will be negative 30 meters per second. Remember that at any given time, the biker is really moving with one speed in one direction. The way that we need to think about projectile problems is like splitting up the velocity into its horizontal part and its vertical part. But in reality, it is moving with not two different velocities at any given time, but one velocity. So what's true of the velocity at one second, the actual velocity, and two seconds and three seconds? Well, we're going to use the horizontal component and the vertical component to figure out what that velocity is. So at time zero, there is only a horizontal component. There's no vertical component. So the actual velocity is 20 meters per second. At one second, though, we have the horizontal component of 20 meters per second. And if we add to that the negative y component of negative 10 meters per second, if we make a right triangle with the horizontal and vertical component, the hypotenuse of that right triangle, that's the actual velocity. So this one represents the actual velocity. We do that at two seconds. So horizontal plus vertical, make our little right triangle. That diagonal will be the actual velocity. And for three seconds, we do the same thing, 20 meters per second in the x direction. And we add to that negative 30 meters per second at the y direction. So the actual velocity will be, again, the hypotenuse of that right triangle. And you can see that if we look at the actual velocity, it's moving to the right at certain size. And then the actual velocity gets bigger, it's bigger, and gets bigger, and points kind of points more downward because the vertical component of the velocity is getting bigger and bigger, even though the horizontal component doesn't change. Well, you might ask, let's say, after three seconds of flying through the air, we know its horizontal component is 20 meters per second, and the vertical component of the velocity is negative 30 meters per second, but how fast is the biker actually traveling? What's the real velocity? Well, that's going to be the length of this arrow. 
So let's see if we can figure that out quantitatively. So if we look at a table of values, right, at different times, we know the horizontal part of the velocity stays constant. The vertical part of the velocity is changing by negative 10 meters per second each and every second. And so again, the black will be how fast it's actually traveling with those components. So in the beginning, you know, all of it's in the horizontal direction. So the actual velocity is 20 meters per second. So let's do this for time three. It has a horizontal component of 20 meters per second and a vertical component of negative 30 meters per second. So what is the actual velocity? Well, again, we've got to look at our little right triangle. And if we want to know the length of the hypotenuse, and we know the length of both sides, in this case, the x component of velocity and the y component of velocity, we've got to use the Pythagorean theorem to figure that out because we know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared or the x component squared plus the y component squared equals the actual velocity squared. So let's plug in what we know and solve for what we don't. So to find the actual velocity, we take the actual velocity squared equals the square of the x component of velocity plus the square of the y component of the velocity. And so on the right side, we get 20 squared plus negative 30 squared. That turns out to be 1,300, and the units are meters squared over second squared. But that's equal to not the velocity, it's equal to the velocity squared. So to solve for just the velocity, you have to take the square root of velocity squared, which means you also need to take the square root of 20 squared plus negative 30 squared. So the velocity is equal to the square root of 1,300 meters squared over second squared, which turns out to be about 36 meters per second. So after three seconds of falling, it's moving at 36 meters per second in reality at some particular angle, right? It's not moving only in the x direction or the y direction, it's moving in both. If we look back at our triangle, if we solve for this angle here, theta, that'll tell us at what direction it's moving at that speed, like below the horizontal. And so we're gonna have to use math that we know that works with right triangles and angles, like sine, cosine, or tangent. So we know the opposite side is about 30 meters per second in length. The adjacent side to that angle is 20 meters per second in length. So let's use the tangent equation because the tangent of an angle is equal to the opposite length divided by the adjacent length. So 30 meters per second length divided by 20 meters per second length. And that's gonna give us about 1.5 with no units. And to solve for theta, we've got to take then the inverse tangent of the left side. So we have to then take the inverse tangent of the right side. So solving for theta, undoing the tangent, we get that theta is equal to the inverse tangent of 30 divided by 20 or 1.5. And that turns out to be about 62.6 .6 degrees. So that's the angle that the, the, the actual velocity makes with the horizontal direction. So if I ask you what the velocity of the biker is after three seconds of falling. Velocity is both speed and direction. So the biker is moving with a, at a speed of 36 meters per second at a direction of 62.6 .6 degrees below the horizontal. It's not enough to say whether they have a positive or negative velocity because that doesn't make sense when we're talking about two-dimensional motion. So the direction of a two-dimensional velocity, if it's not, or of a velocity, if it's not only in the x direction or the y direction, has to include an angle along with the speed, not just a positive or negative sign. So hopefully this helps you guys think through quantitatively how to think through problems where objects are flying through the air that are given an initial horizontal velocity.